Good evening. Buenas noches. I am Adam Scher, Vice President for Collections and Exhibitions, and I welcome you to your Virginia Museum of History and Culture. The Virginia Museum of History and Culture acknowledges the Powhatan Confederacy and the Monacan Nation that inhabited the land where this museum now stands. We seek to honor that history and maintain thoughtful relationships with those indigenous people and all the tribes of Virginia. Their story is integral to Virginia's past, present, and future. We'd also like to acknowledge the generosity of the late Ann Worrell, who endowed this lecture series in honor of Dr. Charles Bryan, former president and CEO of the Virginia Historical Society. And it just so happens that our next lecture uh, on March 15th at noon will be with Charlie Bryan uh, in conversation with our current president and CEO, Jamie Boskett, uh, where Charlie will be talking about his book, Imperfect Past, More History in a New Light. Also mark your calendars uh, for March 18th at noon, where we'll be uh, partnering with the Marshall uh, Center for Constitutional History and Civics as part of the Marshall Scholar Series. Uh, we will be featuring Akil Reed Amar, who will be talking about his book, The Words That Made Us America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. And our final lecture for March, uh, we'll be on the 24th, also at noon, uh, where we'll be very pleased to have with us uh, Carl Lounsbury, who is a former architectural historian of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, who will be talking about uh, his book that just came out last year, The Material World of Air Hall. Uh, but we're very pleased to have with us this evening Gail Jessup White, uh, who will be talking about her book, Reclamation, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson and a Descendant's Search for Her Family's Lasting Legacy. Growing up in black middle class Washington, D.C., Gail was 13 when she first heard the family lore. Fueled by personal loss and professional angst, she devoted herself to uncovering the truth, a commitment that ultimately led her to Monticello, where she became the first community engagement officer for the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Reclamation is an intimate exploration of race, class, and redemption in a country that continues to struggle with its complicated and painful origins. Gail Jessup White is Public Relations and Community Engagement Officer at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, the nonprofit organization that owns and operates Monticello. A former award-winning television reporter and anchor, Gail started her career at the New York Times. She's written and spoken extensively about her work at Monticello, and she is the first descendant of Jefferson and the families he enslaved to be employed by the foundation. Please give a warm VMHC welcome to Gail Jessup White. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I have to tell you, that when I first started coming to the Banner Lectures, oh, more than a decade ago, I always wondered what it would feel like to be on the stage. And I can tell you, it's thrilling. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you. So how did a nice little girl from Washington, DC, from a comfortable family, Catholic family, end up on this stage talking about race, because we will talk a little about race. And if you can't hear me, please let me know. OK. I used to be a broadcaster, but I lost that broadcasting voice a few years ago. It's a long journey. And I'm going to start at the beginning. I have a friend who teaches writing, and when I was thinking of writing a book so many years ago, I asked her, where do I begin? How do I do this? And she said, start at the beginning. So, Reclamation, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson, and A Descendant's Search for a Family's Lasting Legacy is part memoir, part detective story, and part history lesson. 
It's filled with recollections of a happy youth. I grew up a happy kid in Washington. I grew up in a loving family, solidly middle class. And we appeared to be unburdened with the concerns of the world. But we had many secrets, and I write about those secrets in the book. This is my family. I was the youngest of five. Obviously, that's my dad holding me. My older sisters, older sisters on the end, mom in the middle, and my brother. I have another brother. That's one of the secrets that the family had, which again, I write about in the book. And he wasn't, he didn't live with us because I don't want to tell you too much because that's not the focus of tonight's conversation, but it is very much a part of the story and a part of the tragedy that is this story, a part of the tragedy that's part of American history. But this is my family. Now, I said I would begin at the beginning, and that will take us to when I first heard we were descended from Thomas Jefferson. Please do not laugh at the next slide. You did, somebody laughed. <laughs> this is me at 13 years old. I went to a Catholic school called St. Francis de Sales. It was when I was 13 that I began to learn things about the world that I hadn't been exposed to. I hadn't been exposed to racism. Washington DC was a predominantly black city. It was what we call chocolate city, the first chocolate city. I grew up around black professionals. And the kids, the white kids I knew were Catholic. We didn't separate ourselves based on race. We separated ourselves based on religion and class. What our parents did, where we went to school, where we went to church. So it was a comfortable way to grow up. So when I learned about racism when I was 13 years old, I was shocked and hurt and buried it. I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to know about it. I didn't want to identify with it. I also learned when I was 13 years old that there was some friction in my parents' marriage. I write about that. And the source of it, it was complicated. And I also learned when I was 13 years old that we were descended from Thomas Jefferson. So how did I learn that? Let's get off this slide. Let's get rid of that picture. My oldest sister, Janice Terry, seen here on the end, the one who's dominating the photograph, is close to 20 years older than I. She came to visit our home when I was 13 after having spent two years living in Asia where her husband was covering the Vietnam War for Time magazine. He was assistant bureau chief. His name was Wallace Terry. And my sister was visiting us and she was telling my dad, my sister's a big talker, she still is, very dramatic. She was telling my dad about an occasion at the American Embassy in Saigon, where she and her husband were the guests of honor. Back in those days, it was a big deal to work for Time Magazine. They were the guests of honor. It was a dinner party. They were the only black people at the party. And at this dinner party, the guests were discussing their lineage now, you guys love history. We all know that the United States fought a war <laughs> to separate ourselves from the monarchy. Well, the people at this table didn't seem to know that. So they were speaking of themselves as, as if they were descended from royalty. So my sister, this is in the 70s. My sister took great umbrage to this. She was very offended. She was a small R Republican, small D Democrat, still is. And she looks at her husband. The culture was very different then. She looks at her husband seeking approval. He knew what she was going to say. So he nods. And my sister, as you can see, she's very glamorous. Tall, slender, swan-like neck, model-like. She rises herself to her greatest height. And she announces to the dinner guests, well, I am descended from Thomas Jefferson. Well, she said the room went dead silent. You could only hear the silver touching the china because then People would not acknowledge, did not want to acknowledge, historians did not acknowledge that Jefferson had had children with an enslaved woman. So when I heard this story, I was shocked. 
because I didn't know this. I didn't know that Jefferson owned people. I wasn't taught that. Most of us were not taught that. And I could not imagine how I, this black kid growing up in Washington, D.C., could have been related to Thomas Jefferson. So I turned to my dad, who to me was as close to God as you could possibly get. And I said to Daddy, how could this be? Can you help, help me understand this? And Daddy, Dad's response was pretty terse. And he said, well, that's what they say. So I looked at my dad, who was 6'2", had red hair, had freckles, and an aquiline nose with a sloping bridge. I came to learn that that was the Jeffersonian nose. I eventually learned that my grandmother, his mother, was from Charlottesville. But we knew very little about her. Let's see, in the next slide should be a picture of her. This is my grandmother. Her name was Eva Robinson Taylor. Now, I said this as part detective story, so I'd like you to remember that name, Taylor. Eva Robinson Taylor. Dad told me that she sometimes went by Robinson. She sometimes went by Taylor. He didn't know why. And the reason he didn't know is because she died when he was five years old. This left a big hole in my dad's heart. And I loved my dad. So it left a big hole in my heart, too. Part of the reason I wanted to learn about Jefferson was because I wanted to help fill my dad's empty space. I wanted to comfort him. That was part of it. So here's Eva, Eva Robinson Taylor. We don't know much about her, but I will learn a lot about her in the years to come. What we do know is that she married this man, my grandfather. His name was Arthur Jessup. He was a sailor in the Spanish-American War. No, I am not that old. I came late, my dad came late, and I came late in my parents' life. My grandfather was born in 1873. That's hard to comprehend, isn't it? But he was. They lived in Washington, D.C., and they married around 1901. And they had several children, among them these girls. These are my aunts. This is Louise and Thelma. I did not make that up. <laughs> Louise and Thelma, beautiful children. You can see how well turned out they are. Dressed up, pretty girls. And two other girls. This is Artie, closest to me, and that's Carrie. We don't have a picture of the fifth daughter, Helena. And the reason we don't is because all five girls died while they were still teenagers or children. Helena died in infancy, Artie died young. They all died, along with their mother, from tuberculosis. And this is part of the pain that my dad carried with him. This is part of the tragedy that was his family. The only two children to survive the carnage were my dad and his brother. This little fella, <laughs> this is my dad. <laughs> He was so cute. And this is his brother, Eugene, Uncle Eugene, the older brother. Now, Uncle Eugene was three years older than my dad, so he knew a little bit more about his mother than my dad did. My dad did not remember his mother. He would say to me as I began to explore this history with him, trying to prod from him what I could, the little that he knew about this oral history that we were related to Thomas Jefferson, um, he just... He would say, I don't, I don't know, Gail. I, I don't remember my mother. I can't remember her voice. I can't remember her face. But his brother, his brother knew more. So I became a journalist as I grew older. Very curious kid, grew into a curious adult. And I went to my uncle so many years later, and here they are as adults. The tall one, 6'2", I said, is my dad. And that's his brother, Eugene. And it was on this occasion that my uncle promised me that he would leave me pictures, the pictures you saw earlier, of his sisters, my aunts, 
And this Bible. This Bible, he said, belonged to my grandmother and was passed down from her mother. Now, please note on this Bible, engraved 1821, with the initials DT. You'll recall that this is part detective story, that dad said his mother's name was Robinson or Taylor. He wasn't sure. But there's the T. There's a clue to that second name. I also collected from my uncle this photograph. This, he said, was my grandmother's sister. Look at this woman. Does this woman look white to you? Yeah. And she lived as a white woman, we learned. My uncle told me, my dad didn't know about her at all. My uncle told me that this woman, we think her name was Lucy. We don't know much about her. But when my grandmother died, she was visiting, and she says to my grandfather, there were three children surviving, Carrie and the two boys. And she says, let me take them to New York. She was living with New York. She was clearly wealthy. And I will get them educated, and I will care for them. And my grandmother, my grandfather said, no, I want to keep the kids with me. She says, if you don't allow me to take these children, I will never come back. She kept her word. She never came back. One of those kids died, Carrie, the daughter died. As I said, the boy survived. So let's fast forward a few decades after this happened, and this would have been in 1920. In the early 60s, my mom gets a phone call from some long distance. So I'm looking at everyone here. You all know what long distance used to be like. <laughs> she gets a long distance call from New York. And they say, is this the home of Cedric Jessup? Mommy says, yeah. She says, my mother was very polite. She wouldn't have said yes. Yeah. She would have said, yes, it is the home of Cedric Jessup. And the person says, well, there's a woman here. She's quite well off. She's quite rich. And she says that Cedric Jessup is her nephew. She's very ill. People are taking advantage of her. She's getting senile. And my mother says, oh, well, we don't know of this person. And my mother's listening to the voice on the phone. And she says, well, is this person Negro, the vernacular of the time? Is she Negro or white? And the person on the other end says, well, she's white. And my mother says, well, she can't be related to us. It was this woman. We lost all that history. We lost a family member. And we lost my inheritance. <laughs> but that's part of the tragedy of race in America. Inequity. Inequity is part of what killed my aunts. Separation. That's what kept this woman away from us. She had to make a tough choice to leave her family for what she felt was a better life. But at the end of her life, she wanted to come back, and she couldn't do it. It didn't happen for her. So it's sad. And the thing is, this is not unusual. The story I'm telling you could be told by any, almost any black person in America. It's just that I know the history, and so many black people don't. Do you know why? Because their ancestors were treated like property. So there are no records for them unless you can get tax records or names on ledgers prior to 1870, when black people were counted as humans in their first census. So the years go by. Not too many clues. I grow up, I have a family, I go to Howard University. I failed to mention that. We have to mention Howard University. On to Northwestern to study journalism. I came, became a reporter, got married, had this wonderful son, got divorced, got married again, and moved to Virginia. Now I have to tell you, I am a total Washington, D.C. girl. I love my hometown. I should not be standing here this evening. I should be in Washington, D.C., luxuriating in the glories 
of that city. However, something called me here. I'm not a religious person. I grew up Catholic, but I'm not religious anymore. But something called me here. There's a reason I'm here. There's a reason I have this mic in front of me. There's a reason you're here. My ancestors called me here to tell their story. My ancestors called me to Richmond, Virginia, 70 miles from where they were enslaved to learn about them. My ancestors made this happen. I didn't do it. They did it. So I became, in 2014, a fellow at Monticello. I didn't know much at that point. I wasn't sure of my connection. I just knew that my sister said we were descended from Thomas Jefferson. And she knew it, I should mention this, from a woman who was my grandmother's half-sister. We called her Aunt Peachy. She was a domestic. She couldn't read, write, or spell her own name. But she said to my sister, she was growing up, you're descended from Thomas Jefferson. I'm not, but you are. My sister's having a conversation with my dad. And she says, I'm descended from Thomas Jefferson. I just happened to hear it. And I happened to marry my second husband, who says, we're moving to Richmond, Virginia. And I said, OK, I love you. I'm going. And here we are. And there I was as a fellow at Monticello. As a fellow, I worked with a woman named Cinder Stanton. I actually met her before this time. Cinder Stanton is in my next slide. Cinder Stanton was a scholar at Monticello. She's since retired. She founded an, an initiative called the African American Oral History Project. And through that oral history project, Cinder and her colleagues, a woman named Diane Swan Wright, and another woman named um, Gray, her last name is Gray. I can't remember her first name right now. Traveled all over the country collecting oral histories from the descendants of Monticello's enslaved community. Now, again, I still wasn't sure how I was related to Jefferson. I assumed it was through Jefferson and Sally Hemings because my imagination wouldn't take me anywhere else. There wasn't any evidence of anything else. I liked the idea of being descended from Sally Hemings. So I accepted it. Cinder knows more about Thomas Jefferson, however, and the enslaved community than anyone else on earth. There's some young people who are challenging her, I'm sure, at this point, but she knows more than anyone else on earth. And she became my mentor, and she helped me get this um, fellowship at Monticello. And this is her book, Those Who Labor for My Happiness, which is how Jefferson described the people he enslaved. By the way, Jefferson owned 607 people during his life, 607 people, men, women, and children, which he sold, mortgaged, bequeathed, traded, rented out, and slept with. Well, one of them. It was with Cinder's help that I was able to learn of my ancestry. And here's what I found out. Remember the name Taylor. Remember the initial T on the Bible. We found my grandmother, Eva, that beautiful woman in one of the first slides, living with one of Jefferson's great-great-granddaughters. What Cinder explained to me was that it was not uncommon for the children of white men, in particular, to live with their families. And there she was, my grandmother, living in the home of one of Jefferson's great-great-granddaughters, listed in the census record as servant. Then we went back, Cinder did, Cinder and I, to a, the census record of 1880. We found a woman named Rachel Robinson. And in the, I should say this too. Eva, my grandmother's name was Eva Robinson in the census record. We found a woman named Rachel Robinson living alone with two children, one unnamed, one Lucy, named Lucy. Just two doors away is a member of the Jefferson family. His name is Moncure Robinson Taylor, unmarried. 
So put it together. It made sense. What we had thus far was oral history. We had the census records. And we had a little speculation. Rachel Robinson, we determined, was my great-grandmother. Moncure Robinson, we determined, was my great-grandfather. I'm married, living two doors away from Rachel. So who's Moncure Robinson Taylor? He's one of Jefferson's great-great-grandsons. So Jefferson, it turns out, is in fact my ancestor. We've determined thus far, based on oral history and the documents and speculation. This would have made Jefferson my five times great-grandfather and his wife my five times great-grandmother. So where does Sally Hemings fit in? Well, I have to tell you, when we learned this, I was crushed because I really wanted to be related to Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings is an extraordinary woman, and we'll talk about her in a minute. But there was good news coming. Thanks to Cinder, we found more documents. Cinder wrote to me one evening. She sends me an email. She says, I just couldn't sleep. Um, I was just working on one thing, and I decided I was going to look up Robinson's and the death certificates on Ancestry. And she finds the name Peter Robinson. Peter Robinson was my great-grandmother's brother. She had a lot of siblings. We found them in the 1870 census. And the document on the far side is his death certificate. And this death certificate has on it the name of his mother. And it was Sally. Now, we know from the 1870 census that my grandmother's name was Sally Robinson, but we didn't know her maiden name. On this document is her maiden name, and it's spelled H-E-M-M-A-N-S. What's that? If you're in the South and you're dropping that (laughs) I-N-G, what does that sound like to you? Hemmons, Hemmons. Her name was Sally Hemmons. She was named after her aunt, Sally Hemmings, the famous Sally Hemmings. Neither one of us could sleep that night. We picked up another book written by Annette Gordon-Reed where she writes about the Hemmings. It's the Hemmings of Monticello. And we trace Sally Robinson, Sally Hemmings Robinson, to Peter Hemmings. Who's Peter Hemmings? the brother of the famous Sally Hemings. So this is one of those eureka moments that you just live for. It turns out that Peter Hemings, the brother of Sally Hemings, is my three times great-grandfather. So I'm a Hemings after all. Thrilled about that. But it also tells us something else. What's in the next slide here? Okay, this is the... Exhibition of Monticello. It also tells us something else. We know that Thomas Jefferson had relations with Sally Hemings, and they had six children together, four of whom survived into adulthood. We know that Sally Hemings was the half-sister of Jefferson's wife, Martha, because Martha's father had relations with Sally Hemings' mother, Elizabeth. That's two generations thus far of Hemings's and Jefferson kin. We also know that Jefferson's son-in-law, after Jefferson's daughter Mariah died, takes up with a Hemings woman whose name was Betsy. The family admired her so much that they buried her next to him when she died. And he had another wife. He remarried. The wife moved away, and was, or they moved her remains away, and she was buried with her family. But the Jefferson kin... It was an Epps. The Jefferson kin is buried next to a Hemings, three generations. And then we get to my great-grandparents, Jefferson's great-great-grandson, Moncure Robinson Taylor, one of the names that my grandmother used. Remember, there's the T on the Bible. All this is coming together. Four generations of Jefferson kin and Hemings kin entangled. What does that tell us about that system? What does that tell us about how close P. 
people were to each other. What does that tell us about how we're related? They're kin. They shared blood. They shared homes. But there's no equality there. There's my grandmother living in the home of her white family as a servant. And it gets worse. As I continued doing the work, I found that Sally, Sally Hemmons, who became a Robinson, Sally Hemmons was enslaved by Martha Jefferson Randolph. Martha Jefferson Randolph was my four times great grandmother. She was enslaved by her. We have a letter. They were cousins, let me add. We have a letter written by one of Martha Jefferson Randolph's daughters about how they had to whip a girl named Sally. Martha Jefferson whipped Sally Robinson, my great, great grandmother. My three times white great grandmother whipped my two times great black grandmother. These are truths that we have to live with that are very personal to me because they happened in my family, but they happened in many, many other families. I just happen to know. And it's hard to take, but it's true. So where does Sally Hemings fit in? My genealogical chart? She is my four times great aunt. In 2018, Monticello opened an exhibition called The Life of Sally Hemings, where we recognized not only that Sally Hemings had born Jefferson six children, <clears throat> but we recognized her humanity. And that, to me, was more important than anything else. Because for too long, we have seen enslaved people as mindless laborers, rather than as individuals. We have not humanized enslaved people, but we humanize Sally Hemings. It's a step forward. Sally Hemings was a seamstress. She was a world traveler. She likely spoke a little French. She was a mother, a daughter, a sister, and she was an emancipator because the four children she had with Jefferson were freed upon her insistence when she negotiated with Jefferson when she was a 16-year-old girl in Paris when their liaison, according to their son, first began. So what does that tell us about Sally Hemings? She was really smart. That's what it tells us. She was really bold because she was 16, negotiating with one of the most influential men of his era. Thomas Jefferson had power even then. But she wasn't afraid. She spoke up. And in order, I'm sure you already know the story. If you don't know the story, raise your hands. Okay, then I'll tell the story. Thomas Jefferson was minister. Let me back up. Thomas Jefferson's wife, Martha, died after 10 years of marriage. He was stricken with grief. The only person who could comfort him was his daughter, Martha. Soon after that, he was given the appointment of being ambassador to France. So he and Martha and an enslaved man named James Hemings, my four times great-grandfather, moved to France, moved to Paris, leaving behind two of Jefferson's other daughters, Lucy and Mariah. Lucy dies. They're little girls. Lucy dies. Again, he's grief-stricken. So he sends for Mariah to come to Paris to be with him. Who accompanies Mariah, who's a little girl? Not much older than your girls. Who accompanies Mariah? 14-year-old Sally Hemings. I did an interview today earlier in Charlottesville, and someone said, well, Sally Hemings was almost, she was only 14 years old. How could she travel 3,000 miles on a ship for weeks and weeks away from her family to accompany a child who was not really much younger than she? And I said, because she was considered an adult, because enslaved people, children, started working at the ages of 8, 9, and 10. So by 14, she was considered a mature person, mature enough to accompany a child thousands of miles away from home. Again, 
what does that tell us about the institution of slavery? And what does that tell us about Sally Hemings? So she's in Paris, Jefferson's wife's half-sister, possibly looked like his dead wife. There's an attraction there on his part. We don't know how she felt, but we can be pretty confident there was an attraction there on his part. And they begin a liaison. And according to their son, Madison, who was, um, had a memoir pu- published in a newspaper in the mid-19th century, she became pregnant. He used a French word for it, actually. I don't know, my French is so poor, I won't even try it. And when it was time for Jefferson to return to the States, James Hemings and Sally Hemings could have petitioned the courts in France to be free to live as free people in France. But Jefferson wanted to bring Sally Hemings back home with him. And she demurred. She says, no, I'm staying here, baby. (laughs) I like it here. I don't care if a revolution is about to break out. I can be free here. So rather than give in to Jefferson, she negotiates with him. She negotiates freedom for their unborn children and privileges for herself. She was very smart. Historians cannot say this, but I, as a descendant and other descendants, believe that Sally Hemings actually wanted to come back home. She was pregnant. It was her first child. Her family was very close. How do we know her family was close? Because they named each other after family members. Peter, Sally, the name has gone down through generations. So we think she wanted to come home and be with her mother. But Jefferson didn't know any better. (laughs) So she negotiated with him protection for herself. Remember now, we're living in a different era where women depended upon men for protection. Protection for herself and freedom for her children. She was an emancipator. She was brave. And she's to be admired as a human, as an individual. And that's what we do, and that's what you see in the exhibition. Although you won't see what I just told you about (laughs) about Sally Hemings probably wanting to come home, but that's what we think. It seems logical, doesn't it? So I have a very complicated family tree, and I'll just go over it very quickly. Cedric Jessup's my dad. Teresa Green's my mom. These are her parents, Christine Hunt and Della Foss Green. Another story unto itself. My grandfather, I did not know him, was a famous White House chef. He worked for Woodrow Wilson and Warren G. Harding, but um, he acquired fame when he was Wilson's chef. On the other side, we have my dad, Cedric, Arthur and Eva Robinson, Rachel Robinson, Moncure Robinson Taylor, thus the name that she occasionally used. I eventually found documents with the Taylor name on it, sacred documents. The official documents, government documents, she used Robinson, sacred docu- documents. Interestingly, she used Taylor. That kind of tells you of her connection to the family, I think. Um, her parents were Edmund Robinson and Sally Hemings, the niece of the famous Sally Hemings. And then, of course, Monica Robinson Taylor. Um, we have Martha Randolph, who's the daughter of Thomas Jefferson Randolph, who was Jefferson's favorite son. And these are all cousins marrying each other, by the way. It was just the done thing. And then we have Thomas Jefferson on the bottom. I chose to put my parents at the top to honor them. We have spent so much time talking about Thomas Jefferson for the last couple of hundred years. Time to talk about some other people now. Time to talk about the people who made his life possible. We've had many conversations where we have to acknowledge that without the enslaved people who made Jefferson's life possible, who gave him his lifestyle, 
who were worth more than the property he owned. We might not have had the Declaration of Independence, at least not written by him. Enslaved people gave Jefferson freedom. What a paradox, isn't it? Enslaved people gave Jefferson freedom. And the next slide on the Hemings line, again, my parents, Cedric and Teresa, Arthur, Eva, Rachel Robinson, Moncure, Edmund, Sally Hemings, and then all of her siblings, and Elizabeth Hemings, who had a connection to John Wales. And we believe that, we know that her father was a man named Captain Hemings. And um, we believe that her mother, Elizabeth Hemings' mother, was a full-blooded African woman named Parthenia. Elizabeth Hemings had many children, six with John Wales and others with um, other men, two other men. So she had children with three men. The Hemings family was never separated. It's not true that Jefferson did not sell people he did. He encouraged people to stay married within the plantation and within the estate, to marry within the estate. But if he needed to sell someone, uh, you know, Jefferson spent a lot of money. He died in debt, millions of dollars in debt, actually. He would do so. But these families stayed together. Now, I mentioned, I mentioned earlier J James and Peter Hemings. James Hemings also negotiated with Jefferson for his freedom. James Hemings went to Paris with Jefferson to learn the art of French cookery. Let me rephrase that. I made it sound as if it was an option. It was not an option. Jefferson insisted that James Hemings go to Paris with him to learn the art of French cookery, which he did. And Jefferson actually paid Sally Hemings and James Hemings because, of course, in another country where they're seeking liberté, I told you my French wasn't good, he didn't want it to be known that he was in a slave or did he? So he paid them. James Hemings was paying for French lessons while he was there. So that indicates not only his intellect, but possibly his intent to petition the courts to stay there in France. But instead, he decides to come back to his family, comes back to the States, and he negotiates with Jefferson as his sister did. And Jefferson said, um, says, I'll manumit you on the condition that you teach someone else the art of French cookery. And that person he taught was my ancestor, my three times great-grandfather, Peter Hemings. And he taught them in this space. He taught them in this space. This is what's left of the original kitchen at Monticello. There were two kitchens at Monticello. Jefferson built the second one after he returned from his two terms as, as president. And he covered this space with dirt and filler and made it into a laundry. In 2017, archaeologists at Monticello started uncovering the space that had been covered for 200 years. And we found remnants of the original kitchen, including ash from that space. And so as that excavation was happening, they invited me to come visit because they know how close I feel to my ancestors. So I have on a yellow jacket. You can see I had on a yellow jacket. But I climbed down into the bowels of that red clay, and I rubbed my hands in that clay, and I rubbed it as far as I could, up into, close to, as close to my skin as I possibly could, because I knew that that was the space where my ancestors, my great-great-great-grandfather had stood, where he had learned the art of French cookery. And more poignant, he learned that art so his brother could be freed. Peter would remain enslaved most of his life. He was sold along with scores of other enslaved people on the lawn of Monticello six months after Jefferson died. Jefferson died on July 4th, 1826. In January 1827, Peter, along with scores of others, were sold. So in that space, I feel closer to my ancestors than any other space on that estate. And I think about the love that those men shared. 
that Peter learn this skill so his brother could walk away to freedom. Now, Peter actually does eventually gain his freedom, but it took years and years. After he was sold, a relative bought him, and then he manumitted him. But his family remained enslaved, including my great-great-grandmother. So, that's just a small sliver of the story. I wrote this story to honor my family. I wrote this story so people could know more about enslavement, entanglement, kinship, history. There's a lot about my own evolution in this book. And I wrote it because I love these people. I love these people. I love my family. I love my ancestors. As I said earlier, they called me here. This is my sister Patricia on the end. She's an artist. She lives in California. On the far end is the very glamorous Janice Terry, the one who heard this story from Aunt Peachy, the half-aunt who could not read, write, or spell her own name. This is the one with the big mouth. <laughs> that's my brother, my dad. That's me in the middle. And that's my wonderful mother. Now, I write things in this book that I frankly would not have written if my parents were alive, because it's a very honest book. And nothing is as it appears on the surface. And my parents' marriage was not as it appeared on the surface, which I discovered, as I mentioned earlier, when I was 13 years old. It is not that I do not honor my parents. I do. I think their story, again, helps us by humanizing black people. You know, again, we see enslaved people as a monolith, but it's too easy for us to see black folk today as a monolith. But we're not. It's not perfect, and it's not all bad. And my life was not perfect. It was human. My parents were human. Their experiences were human, and I write about those experiences. And I honor them, but I wouldn't have written it if they were alive. And this is my family. So my family has grown exponentially since I learned of my relationship to the descendants of the enslaved community. In 18, or 2018, in 2018, we had one of the largest family reunions of its kind in the country. Some 250 of us gathered there in this space which is likely where our ancestors were sold in 1827. We gathered there to reclaim that space. We gathered there to commune, to stand strong, to recognize the resilience and the strength of our ancestors. For were it not for their strength and tenacity and pride, we would not be here. Were it not for their endurance, our country wouldn't be what it is today. So I'm proud of my ancestors, and I was proud to be there that day as we celebrated who they were and who we are as Americans. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. I hope you do. So we had, um, they say, getting word. They were um, the creation of my colleague, a woman named Nia Bates, who's now earning her PhD at Princeton, but she was the director of the Getting Word Oral History Project at that time. And she had this idea to have these blue shirts, and on the back of those shirts was a, a round um, representation of family members and the names of the various families um, that were enslaved in Monticello. So that's the significance of the blue shirts. You can ask a scary question. I, I'm, I'm happy to take on any questions. Was any DNA used for this group? 
Good question. So, all questions are good questions, by the way, but I particularly like that one. DNA was not used for this group, but DNA was used in my story. I mentioned that we had oral history. I mentioned that we had some documentation. And we also had DNA. So at one point, when I started doing all this work, and I'm in Virginia, I'm in Richmond, I don't have a job. I've got this new hobby. I'm online all the time with Ancestry DNA. I'm digging up as much as I can. I'm going to courthouses. I'm having the time of my life with this great hobby, which eventually became my career. And I'm online, and I'm looking, I'm getting notifications about Jefferson descendants. And I get a notification about a book of poetry written by a woman named Tess Taylor. I write about her in the book as well. We have a complicated relationship. And Tess Taylor wrote a book called The Forage House. There's that Taylor name again. And I write a note to um, responding to her publisher, and I said, Tess, I too am a tailor. My grandmother was a tailor, but she didn't exactly come through the front door. And I wrote The Plot Thickens. And Tess wrote back. And long story short, which you're welcome to read about in two chapters, we ended up getting a test, a DNA test, through Ancestry and 23andMe. And that provided us with the scientific evidence. We are matched, or my DNA matches exactly where it should on those charts in correspondence to where my family matches based on the documentation. The oral history didn't tell us how we were related, but the documentation has done so, and we match perfectly. So that provided the evidence, the scientific evidence that we needed to demonstrate that we were related to um, Jefferson and his Randolph kin. The similar case happened with Sally Hemings, and some of these people in this picture are descended from Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. In 1998, there was something called the Foster Study. The descendants of Hemings and Jefferson have the same evidence that I have. They have some documentation, they have strong oral history, and then they have DNA. In 1998, the Foster Study determined not that Jefferson was definitively the father, but that the people that his family claimed fathered Sally Hemings' children could not have. In addition to that, every time Jefferson came back from a tour in D.C. to visit Monticello, what do you think happened nine months later? <laughs> so there's really strong evidence there, very strong, strong enough for the foundation to acknowledge that the four surviving children were his. Thank you for that question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Coming to the table. You have that. <laughs> yeah, I do. So now, um, museums are telling the history of people of color on um, plantations differently than what they once did. Yes. Is it a requirement at Monticello that um, the enactors and the, when I did the slave walk, and, oh my gosh, they, they've all been just absolutely remarkable. Um, is there a requirement that they uh, teach this, or, or, or is there a requirement in what it is that they can and cannot say, or, uh, or how they teach this? Is I understand. I yeah. understand. So at Monticello, and at other museums, but I only speak to Monticello because I know that I know what we do. We are giving parity to the enslaved people. It is very important that we as Americans recognize the contributions of the enslaved and black Americans. We helped build this country before it was a country. We started in 1619 when the first Africans were brought here. So at Monticello, 
we raise the profile of the enslaved. No one's trying to chop Jefferson down. We're just being honest about who he was. He was a human being. He was a very flawed human being. But what we're doing is raising the people who made his life possible. It's important to teach this history. And there we know that there's some resistance occurring in some places in the country, even here. It's important that we teach this history, though, so we can understand how we live today and why we're living as we are today, so we can understand the inequities, inequities that continue to exist in housing, in education, in health. Just look at the pandemic and the statistics and who suffered most as a result of the pandemic. It's not incidental. These are the vestiges of enslavement that we continue to live with. When we face these truths, it doesn't hurt us, it heals us. It gives us a chance to address the wrongs that have been done to people, and not just black people, there's a long list. <laughs> and some white people, let's be honest. There's a long list of people who have been marginalized in this country. And we need to be honest about that. We need to be honest about enslavement and what still lingers with us as a result of it. We need to be honest about redlining. I write about this in my book. My parents built a house, lovely brick house in Washington, DC, but it had to be on the wrong side of town. So when they sold, because they were redlined, so when they sold their house about 20 years ago, it was worth about a third of what the house on the other side of town was worth, same house. It was the same house because my dad and mom used to drive over to look at what those houses in Northwest DC were like so they could model their home after what they saw. My, my uncle was an architect, he designed their house. So their net worth was far less than it would have been if they'd been able to build their house. They had the wherewithal, they could have done it. If they'd been able to build their house on the other side of town. We still live with this. And we have to correct it, but we can if we don't know the truth. The truth will set us free. It's not a cliche. It carries weight. So yes, we are raising the profile of the enslaved because they're important and their contributions were important and their descendants' contributions are important. Um, you had mentioned earlier that it's hard to um, find records for black people before like uh, the 1870s because of the census and um, they were treated as property before that. Um, and so do you have any like tips, like if we wanted to get started looking into our ancestry, like any tips or resources um, to really get started on that process? So, yes. You can look, if you have any idea of where your family was enslaved, you can look at wills if you know names. Um, you can look in newspapers, old newspapers. There's an archive. The National Archives is great. The Freedmen's Bureau records are great. Um, death certificates tell you an awful lot. Because, even census records will tell you an awful lot because on mommy's side, I don't know as much about her family, but I was able to get the names of her ancestors, my ancestors, by looking at census records and finding out where they lived and going back and looking at to courthouses. You can go to courthouses and find out information. It's really hard. You can also join genealogical groups. There's a group in Virginia that meets every Friday. I think they start around 8 o'clock, and they may go until 2 o'clock in the morning. I am never with that group. <laughs> But they provide a lot of support and a lot of information, more information than I can give you right now. But I can tell you the census records are great. The Freedmen's Bureau is great. Um, one of the um, resources I found was in the church. I went back and got my, um, my um, ancestors' baptismal records and christening records, and that was extremely helpful. That's where I found my grandmother's name listed as Taylor. 
So all, all those are good resources, but it, it really is hard, and, and most of us get stuck at 1870. Yes. Oh, I should, might I add one other thing? Tax records. If you can find the names of the people who owned, and that's hard, but if you can find the names of the owner, you can get information from tax records. One of the documents I showed you was a tax record. What is your next chapter? Ah, the next chapter, thank you for asking that question. The next chapter is about my mother's family. My mother comes from a very illustrious and accomplished family. I mentioned that her, um, her father was a famous White House chef. He was a chef for one of the most racist presidents who existed in the 20th century, Woodrow Wilson. But he managed to maneuver in that rarefied world in which he was working and garner the trust of Wilson's son-in-law a man named McAdoo. McAdoo was the Secretary of the Treasury, an art and racist. How do we know that? Because he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Ran for president as a member of the Ku Klux Klan party. A man, not of their party, but ran with their support. But yet, my grandfather managed to get McAdoo to say that he would finance, I think it was called Colored, finance for a, a colored um, theater um, and cafe for 1,000 people in Washington, D.C. There was a caveat, however. He told my grandfather, obviously, you can't tell anybody. I have a letter. The letter's in this book I've already written. You can't tell anybody. Well, my grandfather was a gregarious man. There was no way that he was not sharing this. So he told everybody, and the deal fell through. But that really tells you a lot about who he was and his character and his energy and his ability to maneuver in a world that was so hostile to black people, so hostile. I'm also going to write about a taboo subject in this book. My mother's people became um, educators, principally educators. They were super smart and they were brown skinned people. There's colorism that exists in the black community that separates us. And my mother's family was victim of this. My dad was a white looking man. I looked like my mother. I looked like a mix of them. I have his freckles. And I'm going to write about, and it won't be easy, but I'm going to write about how, why that exists, how it damaged my family, and how it continues to hurt us as a community. It's just one more obstacle to keep us from functioning as a people. And right now I'm not talking about just black people. I'm talking about American people. <laughs> we need to learn to function within our community and outside of our community. And I'm going to write about that with my grandfather as the center of the story because he has an incredible story. But it's painful. It's a different kind of pain that existed with the Hemingses. The Hemingses were white-looking people and light-skinned. My mother's family was not. And I have one cousin in particular who really suffered. She's brilliant. She's gone to three Ivy League schools. <laughs> She's extremely accomplished. But she suffered because of her brown skin. And I'm going to write about that. So that's the next chapter. Anybody else? So I want to end this on an upbeat note, because there's a lot happening in the world right now that's really scary. But for me, finding my family has filled that hole that I inherited from my dad. I am the sum, we are the sums of our ancestors. We are all here this evening because of them. They made us special. If you don't know your family history, I encourage you to learn as much as you can. 
I also encourage you to go to a silent place and to give up all of your inhibitions and to let them come to you. My ancestors talk to me all the time. I'm going to be able to write that book about my mom's family because I'm going to let go and I'm going to hear them. They will come to you because they love you. Thank you.